Good morning, Resurrection. Once again, this is not where I thought we would be this morning. Um, I, you know, I hope that I made the right decision with the, uh, with the weather. I hear that folks north of the church have not really seen much snow at all. Uh, I don't know if you can see behind me right now. Yeah, there we go. In Cool Springs, we it is still snowing like crazy, and we have gotten a boatload of snow uh, already. So it snowed, and then it put a, a layer of ice down after that, and then snow on top of it. Uh, I hear that uh, that Thompson Station, uh, you know, has gotten five or six inches, but then in uh, uh, in Spring Hill, which is just uh, you know a hop, skip, and a jump away, they've had almost nothing. So. Who knows? I hope that we made the right decision. I do know that this way, nobody will get in a wreck and get hurt uh, trying to get to uh, to church. So, you know, I tell people all the time, especially when they're dealing with really difficult circumstances, you just make the best decision you can with the information you have at the time, and then you move on from there. So I, I hope that I made the right decision. Um, but uh, <clears throat> nevertheless, it is, it is done now. Um, so I think that this morning, uh, rather than uh, than have communion, I think we're just going to say our prayers and read the gospel and uh, and have a little sermon, and then uh, and then we will go back to our our snow day. So you all pour another cup of coffee and get uh, get comfortable. <coughs> uh, before I start, I will tell you that I am feeling uh, quite a bit better. I do not feel like running any any races uh, yet. I feel like. Uh, I feel like I have been sick uh, because I, ha I have been sick, but you all have been so sweet and kind to text me and to call and to, and to email. I see a bunch of folks logging on uh, right now, and um, I'm so glad that you are with me. Maybe I have, have ad-libbed long enough that we've got a good number of folks uh, with us this morning. So, uh, dear people of God, the Lord be with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, whose Son, our Savior Jesus Christ, is the light of the world, grant that your people, illumined by your word and sacraments, may shine with the radiance of Christ's glory, that, <coughs> that he may be known, worshipped, and obeyed to the ends of the earth, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who with you and the Holy Spirit lives and reigns one God, now and forever. Amen. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to St. John. On the third day there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Jesus and his disciples had been invited to the wedding. When the wine gave out, the mother of Jesus said to him, They have no wine. And Jesus said to her, Woman, what concern is that to you and to me? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, do whatever he tells you. Now standing there were six stone water jars for the Jewish rites of purification, each holding 20 or 30 gallons. Jesus said to them, fill the jars with water, and they filled them up to the brim. He said to them, now draw some out, take it to the chief steward. So they took it. When the steward tasted the water that had become wine and did not know where it had come from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew, the steward called the bridegroom and said to him, Everyone serves the good wine first and then the inferior wine after the guests have become drunk. But you have kept the good wine until now. Jesus did this, the first of his signs, in Cana of Galilee and revealed his glory and his disciples believed in him. Well, I um, <clears throat> I used to talk about my seminary, uh, Neshota House. I used to talk about it a lot in my sermons. I don't do that quite as much anymore, and I, I guess it's probably because it's it's been a while now. It's it's been uh, it's been twenty years. Uh, but Neshota House, I know that Elizabeth Nash has been at Neshota House this week. Uh, Elizabeth is working on on a, um, a, a a theology master's degree from Neshota House. But it, it's just one of the most beautiful places that you've, you've ever seen. It's, it's in the Kettle Moraine district 
of Wisconsin, and the Kettles and the Moraines are the landforms that were left behind after the glacier plowed in and then plowed back out. Uh, and so there are a lot of lakes, and Neshota House is situated in between two beautiful, beautiful little uh, lakes. It, it just a really, really pretty place. Now, everybody that knows Neshota House can tell you that it can be quite quirky. Uh, it's a, it is a very unique sort of, of place, delightfully so in a lot of ways. It was also a funny place, and I don't mean funny as in odd. I mean funny as in hilarious. Uh, chapel pranks are some of the some of my favorite uh, memories uh, from Neshota House. The dean, when I arrived, thought that chapel pranks were hilarious as long as he wasn't the victim of them. So having a dean that was fine with chapel pranks uh, was a little bit like living in a cross between a monastery and a frat house. So, you know, if we were ever aggravated with the person who was preaching the sermon, we would dip the light bulb in the pulpit light, we would dip it in wax. And so when the, when the, the preacher got into the pulpit and turned the sermon light on, the pulpit light on, by the time he got to about the second page of his sermon, which is exactly where I am right now, that wax would start dripping on top of his head uh, as he was preaching. We put goldfish in the baptismal font. Uh, if, uh, if a professor had ever given a particularly difficult exam or, uh, or something like that and was, uh, was celebrating the Eucharist that week, you know, you can put one drop of water on the, the patent, the little silver plate. You can put one drop of water on there and put his piece of bread, the priest's host, the big piece of bread, put it on top of that drop of water. And within about an hour, it's like super glue, right? You have to have a chisel to, to get it up off of, the, off of the plate. We did all kinds of things like that. We'd put snow in the bell, the 10-ton bell, Michael. Uh, we would put snow in that bell so that the bell ringer would get buried up to his waist in snow the first time you, uh, the first time you rang it. You name it, that's what we, uh, that's what we did at, at Neshota House. And then that dean retired, and we got a new dean. Not as big on chapel pranks was the new dean. In fact, he didn't, uh, he wouldn't, he, he, uh, he wasn't big on a lot of things. Uh, he hated the fact that we rang bells in the Eucharist. You know where where Alex or Bo or or whoever ever will ring the bell when I I lift up the 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 bread or the the wine. Well, he did not like that at all, and so he took all the bells away. Uh, took the bells in the chapel away so that we couldn't do that, and it aggravated us so badly that we we got to where we would park our cars in the, the parking lot beside the seminary, and we would reach into our pockets, and every time the celebrant would lift up the bread or lift up the wine, we would push the button on our key fobs, and so our horns would honk beside the, uh, beside the chapel. So instead of ring, ring, uh, we got honk, honk. Uh, when He didn't like that either. He didn't like that at all. Now, I don't want you to think about Neshota House that it was all fun and games. It, it was a lot of fun and games, uh, but it was tough, too. I, I would pit my theological education against just about anybody. I got a good education at the house. It was pretty old-fashioned, and I'm all for that. I turned out pretty old-fashioned. That, that may be why, but the scholarship was good. And most importantly, I think, the preaching was good. There was not really, as far as I can remember, there was not a weak link in the faculty as far as, as preaching went. The homiletics professor, who was kind of the, the preaching expert at the seminary, uh, he is a good, he's a good man. And I heard him preach a sermon about this very gospel lesson, the one we hear this morning, about running out of wine at the wedding feast at, at Cana. And he always used to say that the point of the story of water into wine was do what your mother says. That was the point of the story. So Jesus was at that wedding feast. You know the story. You just heard it. You've heard it a million times before. He was at the wedding feast in, in a town uh, called Cana, which is in Galilee. And the hosts of the wedding ran out of wine. And that would have been terribly embarrassing to folks at the at the time in the biblical period. So 
Mary comes to Jesus and says, you know, they're going to be really embarrassed. They've, they've run out of wine. She felt sorry for the hosts, and that's why she told, uh, that's why she told Jesus. And his response was, woman, which I understand is actually a very respectful term. Uh, woman, what does that have to do with me? You, that's none of my business. And besides, you know that, that the time has not yet come for me to call attention to myself. Now, Mary does not argue with Jesus. She just looks at the wine steward, and she tells him not to leave Jesus' side until he has told them what to do because she knows that he can fix this problem. So Mary then goes back to enjoy the party. Uh, the servants waited by Jesus' side for their next instructions, and eventually Jesus does just what his mother tells him to do. Uh, he decides he has to do something, and so he told his servants to fill up the huge water urns that they used for purification, uh, right? Those ritual rites of making clean after you become unclean. Uh, and then to take those urns to the steward of the feast. And they did. And when this, the urns got to the steward, they were no longer filled with, with water, but they were filled with wine. And the, re the reaction of the guest was that it, it was apparently very good wine. And Jesus concludes this story, John concludes this story, by telling us that this was Jesus' very first miracle. And by doing this, uh, he manifested his glory and his disciples believed in him. But when I read over the passage again uh, this week, I thought about what my professor had said, do what your mother says, and I was struck by something. It seems from reading this story, as John relates it, that Jesus was determined not to do anything at all about the problem of running out of wine. It wasn't his business, and his time had not yet come. Now, Jesus is God. We, we know that. God from God, light from light, true God from true God. So when we talk about the will of, of Christ, the will of Jesus, we're talking about the will of God. There is only one God. And the will of God was to do nothing about this situation, or, it's, or so it seems to us. That's how the story reads to me. He told Mary that it was none of his business and that his time had not yet come. And he seems pretty resolute in that fact. His mind is made up. But Mary, his mother, had different ideas. And so lowly Mary Mild, the maiden from Galilee, told the King of Kings and Lord of Lords that he was going to have to sit there until he came up with a solution to this problem. Now, Jesus knew that it was not time to reveal himself yet, but he eventually just did what his mother said. So think about that. The will of God was that nothing would be done, right? Seems that way. But that's not what ended up happening. So here's the question. Did the will of God change? Jesus would not, wouldn't have done anything, but at Mary's insistence, or maybe at her pleading, Jesus changed his mind. Now, people are often confused about the will of God. Uh, one of the things that, you've heard me say this before, one of the things that bothers me worst in the world is uh, people lying uh, in bed in hospitals, dying of horrible diseases. And they, they will say things like, well, I know that this is the will of God. And my friends, if you never hear me say anything else at all, hear me say that that is not the will of God. The will of God is that this world would be, would be perfect. And this world is not the way that God wanted it to be. God does not will sickness and God does not will death. In fact, that's why he sent his son to overcome that, and one day that will be overcome. But also, the will of God is not a static thing. He, he didn't decide eons ago, before he created the world, what his will was going to be, and then not to budge from that point from then on. Because God is constantly tweaking and adjusting his beautiful and perfect plan to accommodate for us to fix all of the things that we mess up all along the way. That's the story of the garden. 
The garden is what God wanted, but in our sin and our fallen nature, God had to tweak his plan to fix what it was that we had done. And not only does he adjust his will for our sake, but he apparently changes his mind, too. That happens all the time in the Bible. It happened in this morning's gospel because of Mary pleading with him. Uh, the people of Nineveh fall on their knees before God. And in the book of Jonah, it says that God repented of his terrible anger, meaning he changed his mind. And he changed his mind because the people of Nineveh pleaded with him. The persistent widow got what she wanted because she pleaded with Jesus. In fact, she got what she wanted because she pestered him. And we've talked about pestering God with our prayers before. She pesters him, and he gives her what she needs. The Bible is full of times when God spared his people, cities, armies, kings, you name it, because he listens to the prayers of his people. And just to, to clarify, there is a word for pestering God over and over. It's called prayer. So does prayer matter? Is, is prayer worth fooling with? Well, it absolutely is because God listens to the prayers of his children and his mother. Now, I'm not saying that there's any part of the will of God that we can control. We can't. But I am saying that we can never allow ourselves to fall into the trap of believing that God does not listen to the specific prayers of his people, because he clearly does. Tell God what you need. He just wants to hear from you. Tell him. Be specific in your prayers and pray it over and over and over again until you hear very clearly from him. St. Paul says that. He says, be specific. Let your petitions be known, he says. Paul says that God is absolutely longing for a loving relationship with us. That's why he made us. And he wants the kind of relationship with us where we will tell him what's in our heart. Everything that's in our heart. Now, children of resurrection, we've been praying for some specific things for a long time. It's been a difficult two years. We're still praying for specific things. We've, we've been praying for the Holy Spirit to fall upon us <coughs> and to fall upon our parish uh, or continue to fall upon us and upon our parish. We, we're praying for him to continue growing the bond of love that he has grown among us so beautifully for some time right now. Uh, and we're praying for him to point us on our path, to give us our calling, and to send us out into the world uh, to do what it is that he's given us to do. I believe that we're, we're praying so often that we're pestering him with our prayers, and I actually think he prefers it uh, that way. And God will hear us, and he will eventually answer our prayers. I don't know how he will answer them, but I know that he will answer our prayers because those prayers continue to come and continue to come. And God will send us blessings that will flow like wine as long as we continue to let our petitions be known and to talk to him and to tell us what is in our, our hearts. As we used to say in Children's Chapel, let's tell God that we love him and we believe in him. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. 
He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son he is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. My friends, the peace of the Lord be always with you. Now, I'm, I'm, tr I'm trying to kind of keep up with comments uh, that I see as we go. Sounds like somebody's having trouble hearing me. I don't know if that is a... Um, I don't know if that's a, a connection issue or an issue with my phone or my voice right now or what. I also see Graham Buttry uh, and those dadgum Georgia Bulldogs, although I guess Georgia Bulldogs are better than the alternative, even though I still love y'all. So go, uh, go dogs, uh, Graham. We're proud of y'all. Um, I'll tell you what, in the next, uh, in the next few minutes before we get, as we get ready to say our prayers, if you have a prayer request, comment on that. Uh, uh, just right there in front of you, just a name or, uh, or, or just, uh, you know, an unspoken request or something, something briefly. Put those on there. As we just said, let your petitions be known, and then let's offer up our prayers unto Almighty God. In the words that our Savior Christ has taught us, let us, let us boldly proclaim, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. <clears throat> for, uh, for Doug and for Peter and pestering God for my healing, thank you, Mary, sweet lady, and for Waylon and Bob and Doug. Boy, we are praying for Doug right now. Um, for all of the petitions that we name uh, right now, silently in our hearts, aloud uh, with our lips, uh, in the comments on the, the feed, uh, we pray that Almighty God will take care of those uh, we love, those who we, we know, those for whom we pray. And, um, and we pray that God will also take care of the, uh, the requests that we, we don't know about, but we know that he does. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, I thank you for the good people of resurrection, and I thank you for making us family to each other when you made us family to yourself. Thank you for sending your son, Jesus Christ, to die for our sins upon the cross. Send your Holy Spirit to fall upon our little church in such a way that we will know him when he comes. Give us a sense of clarity with that thing, those things that you would have us to do. Uh, knit those into our hearts. Give us a zeal for your name and for our ministry, and then send us out into the world to do that. Heal the sick, Lord Christ, and give rest to the weary. Bless the dying, soothe the suffering, pity the afflicted, and shield the joyous, and all for your tender love's sake. Amen. And bless Kim for hanging in there. You have no idea how true that is. Uh, thank you, Mary. All right, I don't see any more prayer requests coming in. So <clears throat> the peace that passes understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you and remain with you forever. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. I love you all. You are fine, fine folks. 
Uh, we, uh, surely we will be there together uh, next week. Uh, I, I do hope to uh, have Bible study this Wednesday night, and I know that Women of the Covenant are planning on meeting um, on, on Thursday. So uh, Thursday at 11 o'clock for Women of the Covenant. Covenant. I think they do yoga before that, um, so check your announcements for that. Six o'clock uh, dinner uh, on Wednesday night, uh, youth group at 6.30, um, uh, children with C.S. Lewis uh, at 6.30, and adult Bible study at 6.30. I love y'all so much. Hang in there, stay warm, uh, everybody be safe, and I'll see you soon.